Chapter 12 of Jerry Macaulay, His Life and Work by Jerry Macaulay and edited by Robert M. Offord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kristen Hand. Chapter 12 Called Home. My kingly king at his right hand, my presence doth command, where glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. In the dealings of God with his people, infinite wisdom and infinite love ever blend. All things, death included, work together for good to those who love the Lord. Thus, while we record the decease of him to whose memory these pages are devoted, it is in the blessed confidence that there was no mistake in the time of his departure. Our God knew best when to take his servant. Jerry Macaulay was called home on September 18, 1884, being then 45 years of age. He had long been ailing and knew that the call home would probably come suddenly when it did come. And sudden indeed it was. On the day previous to his death, Jerry was in the best of spirits. In the afternoon, he and Mrs. Macaulay spent a brief while in the Central Park, but immediately on their return home, Jerry was seized with a hemorrhage of the lungs. Physicians were sent for and speedily arrived. It was on that night, while expecting that every moment would be his last, that he said to one of the converts of the mission, pointing upward as he spoke, It's all right up there. He was too much exhausted to say more. Soon there came a little relief and some promise of improvement. On the morning of Thursday, he requested his wife to read a psalm to him, and he listened with evident interest as she did so. On Thursday afternoon, when his wife said to him, Jesus is your Savior, he twice nodded in assent. At four o'clock, or a very few minutes after, another hemorrhage came on, and within three minutes his spirit had taken flight. Pain and suffering were for him things of the past. He had entered into his reward. Since Jesus wept at the grave of Lazarus, it cannot be wrong for us to weep in the hour of bereavement. But while we sorrow, we do not sorrow as those who have no hope. The Christian sings, Death no longer now we die, we but follow Christ on high. The loss of a friend, the loss of an honest, loving, consecrated worker we mourn. Yet with resigned hearts and submissive wills we bow to the dispensation of our all-wise and ever-loving Father in heaven and say, Even so, Father, for it seemed good in thy sight. Remembering how God saved Jerry Macaulay, and how useful in winning souls God made him, we rather rejoice at the sanctified life and its glorious success than mourn at the so-called death. Nay, as we think of the reward that awaited him, the rest that remained for him, the welcome of the Redeemer, the greeting of many now in glory who were saved through his instrumentality, we can even rejoice at his departure. Even his death was not without fruit. One who looked upon his face as the body lay in the casket then and there, resolved by God's help to start in the new life. Nor has Jerry ceased to serve the Lord whom he loved. In that bright world where he is now, the inhabitants serve their king unceasingly. They rest not day or night doing his will. Saved from a life of sin, let us thank God that Jerry Macaulay was transformed. Saved forever from suffering and sorrow, let us thank God that he has been translated. The following account of the memorial service held in the Broadway Tabernacle is taken from Jerry Macaulay's newspaper, of which mention has already been made. The account of the memorial service at number 316 Water Street is from the same source. Broadway Tabernacle, 34th Street and 6th Avenue, was thronged on Sunday afternoon last, September 21st. The audience room, the long deep galleries, the many aisles, the doorways and vestibules were crowded. Hundreds of disappointed people were unable to find entrance and turned away, many of them after coming miles to be present at the memorial service. The exercises commenced at half past two o'clock. The Reverend S. Iranius Prime, D.D., senior editor of the New York Observer, presided. The Tabernacle Choir sang some pieces and Mr. George W. Stebbins sang some solos. It was a most solemn and affecting service. The Reverend Dr. Deems, pastor of the Church of the Strangers, read the scriptures, and when he came to the words, For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, our hearts felt that this was peculiarly true of Jerry Macaulay's work. 
Dr. Prime, before calling upon the speakers who had been chosen to address the large audience, referred briefly to his intimate acquaintance with the deceased. In him, he said, we had proof that the grace proclaimed in our holy religion could save and keep any man. If that could not, nothing could. The Reverend Dr. William M. Taylor, pastor of the Broadway Tabernacle Church, had just returned from Europe. The second item of intelligence he received upon his return was the fact of Jerry Macaulay's death. He had thought of the words of St. Paul, as sorrowing, yet always rejoicing. To the widow it brought sorrow, and there was sorrow as we thought of the loss sustained in the work, but to both sorrows there was a sure antidote. We commend the widow, he said, to the Savior. He will minister to her comfort until the call shall come to her come up higher. In thinking of the man and his work, there are one or two things which have been deeply impressed upon my mind. As I have listened to his testimony and the testimonies of those whom he has led to Christ, I have said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. If Jerry could be saved, who not? After Jerry, anybody. The world's outcasts can be saved by Christ. Jerry would say, and he could say it without affectation, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am chief. Jerry was an instance of a conversion in prison. We sometimes get an idea that there is no use in sending chaplains to prisons. There's a good deal of a feeling of despair in the church about work for prisoners. We should have greater faith in such work. Let us learn to think more for them when coming out of prison. Just as Paul and Damascus fell into the hands of Barnabas, Jerry at length fell into good hands. He once said he felt it so good to be trusted after he came out of prison. Deal gently with the erring, as thy God hath dealt with thee. Jerry's case is a beautiful illustration of how God brings good out of evil. Through the evil of Jerry's early life, God fitted him for special labor. A history like that helps one to understand what God means when he says, I will restore the years which the locusts have eaten. The years destroyed by sin were made up by the multiplied usefulness of the later years of Jerry's life. Thus let sinners put themselves in the Lord's hands. He will restore the years which the locusts have eaten. What a glorious gospel! What a powerful Savior! What a wonderful Redeemer we have! Happily someone is here today, almost swept in by the crowd who is enslaved by evil habits. Take courage. As contact with the bones of the prophet Elisha, started the dead man into life, so coming into contact with the truths this casket preaches, now may you be brought to life. Mr. A.S. Hatch, Jerry McCauley's old and tried friend, spoke with great feeling. The impulses of my heart, he said, would lead me to sit beside this casket, a silent mourner. But, he added, no one except his wife knew Jerry better than I did. It was my privilege in the beginning of his struggle up toward a better life to encourage him by the warm grasp of a helping hand and to speak to him words of hope and cheer. And it has been my privilege also, when clouds and darkness have gathered about my own pathway, to be uplifted and comforted by the simple and childlike yet robust faith of Jerry and his wife and by their sublime trust in the loving providence of God. If I should keep silent, I might seem faithless to the memory of my dear friend. Jerry Macaulay is dead. There are but few names which linked with such an announcement would have aroused a more widespread interest than is felt today wherever men say to each other, Jerry is dead. Not because a great man as the world counts greatness is gone, but in recognition of a humble, sincere, and earnest life devoted for 16 years to the uplifting and saving of lost men and women. The flags of the city are not at half-mast today. No drums will beat in the funeral procession that will bear him to his last resting place tomorrow. No volleys will be fired over his grave. Yet thousands of lowly hearts are bowed down with grief for the friend they have lost. While men and women in all classes of life who owe him a debt of gratitude they are not ashamed to own are pondering with bowed heads and chastened hearts the lessons of the life and death of this once despised and hunted river thief but for sixteen years the chosen servant of God, signally honored and used of him. No fulsome eulogy would be in place over this now still in lifeless form. Could Jerry rise up in his coffin and speak, he would himself rebuke the man who should utter it. 
for jerry gloried not in himself but in the blessed saviour who had transformed him from what he had once been to what by wondrous grace he had become he was always humble for he always remembered the pit from which he had been digged he continually rejoiced in that power of divine love and of the grace of jesus christ that could so save and keep such as he he used to say to the outcasts who felt that they were so low down in sin that there was no hope and no salvation for them there is hope in jesus christ for anybody for he saved me his labors spent for the salvation and redemption of the lost were not in vain and his steadfastness to the end and his triumphant death have now confirmed and emphasized the lessons of his life and his constantly reiterated testimony to the power of jesus to save the church of christ needed the lesson of his sixteen years of labor and their wonderful fruits although theoretically all christians believe that the vilest sinner may be saved yet there is much practical unbelief and skepticism on the subject when they are brought face to face with some of the worst forms of human depravity and of the wretchedness wrought by sin and are called upon to believe and to act as if they believed in reality that individual human wrecks are worth trying to save it is this lesson that none are so utterly lost but there is hope in laboring for their salvation that there is no depth of human degradation to which the arm of jesus cannot reach down and from which his grace cannot lift the sinner up that the life and work of jerry have taught us in conclusion i would hold up jerry as he loved best to hold himself up as i know he would most wish to be held up in this place today as a monument of divine grace as a signal example of the power of jesus blood to cleanse the vilest sinner let our lives be such that when we are called upon to step out from the ranks of the living and take our places in the shadowy procession of the dead we may be able as jerry was to look back upon years spent in earnest work for the master and looking forward and upward say with jerry it's all right mr sidney whittemore then spoke of the worldwide influence of the deceased work many had gone out from water street to be missionaries all over the globe jerry was strong as a lion for courage yet had a heart gentle as a woman's he once spoke roughly to a man who refused to cease his musical performances during the hours of the mission services and afterwards went to the man to ask his forgiveness for his somewhat hasty words and this although the man's insults had brought them out the rev dr deems said a stranger might well ask the meaning of this great audience here were the clergy here were men of means women of culture all come to pay a tribute of respect to whom to a hunted river thief it was the romance of grace and of providence it was not his ancestry his beauty his brains or his services to science that brought out these thousands of people it was all because one day in prison jerry accepted god's offer of salvation and took christ as his present personal and sufficient savior then and there we could all do that then he was a forcible illustration of the possibility of the redemption of a human soul from the bottomless pit of the lowest degradation why labor with such they will fall back many asked but here was one man who for sixteen years had fought the battle against the old sins and lusts and passions and had conquered dr deems closed with an eloquent appeal to the unsaved were there not some present who had heard jerry's appeals from the mission platform and who had not heeded them though jerry's uttered appeals had not moved them should not the appeal of his silent lips win them now these addresses were followed by the singing of a solo by mr stebbins who rendered it with his usual tender pathos amid the intense silence of the audience as he sung the words we too must come to the riverside one by one one by one we're nearer its brink each evening tide one by one one by one the stillness seemed almost painful and it was difficult to restrain the pent-up feelings of the heart the rev wilbur f watkins followed in a prayer that was most tender and touching the choir sang i will sing of my redeemer and dr prime invoked the apostolic benediction the casket containing the remains of the deceased was decorated with floral tributes at once chaste and beautiful a cross lay thereupon and at the close of the prayer offered by dr watkins the rays of sunlight which had been streaming through the windows all the afternoon reached the cross and by their effulgence lit it up with a dazzling brightness it seemed as though heaven would bear shining witness to the efficacy of the cross as the power by which our departed brother had been lifted out of darkness into light 
out of death into life. It was a most impressive incident and a striking type. The light of God's saving power does fall on the cross of Calvary, and at the cross is light, the light of hope and life for all, no matter how lowly nor how lost. The service over, the audience passed by the coffin to take a farewell look at the remains of the honored missionary, nearly two hours being occupied by the sorrowing throng in paying this tribute of respect to the dead. Next day, all that was mortal of the deceased was laid away in Woodlawn Cemetery. There the sacred dust will rest until the archangel's trump shall sound, and those who have fallen asleep in Christ shall rise immortal. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalm 116, verse 15. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Revelation 14, verse 13. There is no death, the stars go down, to rise upon some fairer shore. And bright in heaven's jeweled crown they shine for evermore. The following incident, published in the New York Herald at the time of Jerry's funeral, serves to show how ready Jerry was with a word of sympathy for anyone in trouble who came across his path. It shows also that such words are remembered and treasured even by those whose appearance promises a little lasting impression. Two gentlemen, one of them a representative of the Herald, were standing at or near one of the entrances of the tabernacle, when a shabby-looking old man, who had been lounging on the outskirts of the crowd, approached them and said, "'Beg pardon, gents, but seein' as how you were connected here, and seein' as how I ain't posted on ways and things, I thought I'd ask you for a favor.' Both of the listeners were turning away, expecting an untimely appeal for alms. But the other said, "'I've heard it's the right thing to send flowers and sitch to put on the coffin of anyone who's been good to you. Well, I don't know, gents, whether I've got the rights of it or not, but there's something here for Jerry. He took off his tall, battered hat as he spoke and felt in it with trembling fingers. It ain't any great shakes, he said, and he took out a little bunch of white flowers. Then looking up, as though to read in the faces of the listeners approval or disapproval, he went on apologetically. They're no great shakes, I allow, and I expect they mayn't set off the roses and things rich people send. I'm a poor man, you know, but when I heard Jerry was gone, I gets up and says to myself, go on and do what's fashionable. That's the way folks do when they want to show a dead man's done a heap for him. So here they are. The usher took them. And when you drop them with the rest, though they ain't no great shakes, he added with the old apologetic look, Jerry, who was my friend, will know. And his voice trembled. He'll know they come from old Joe Chappie. What did he do for you? The reporter ventured. A great deal, the man replied, but it's long ago now. My guile had gone to the bad and was dying without ever a bite for her to eat. I got around drunk, but it sobered me, and I hustled about to hunt up some good man. N.G. They asked if she went to Sunday school and all that. Of course she didn't. How could the poor gal? Well, they called her names and said she was a child of wrath, and I went away broken-hearted. When I come across Jerry— and he went home with me and comforted me, and he said that Almighty God wouldn't be rough on a poor gal what didn't know better. She died then, but I ain't forgot Jerry. The poor old wreck could not be prevailed upon to enter, and the crowd was so great that the little bunch of flowers could not reach the casket. But the reporter thought, as he saw the floral emblems there, that none of them would be sweeter to the dead than that simple offering. The incident is a true one, and the little bunch of white flowers has been tenderly preserved by Mrs. Macaulay. Who shall say that the memory of Jerry and of some further word spoken by him may not be the means even yet of bringing the man who gave them to a knowledge of Jerry's Savior? End of chapter 12